Do you want to see something weird? Okay, come with me. I'm riding in a bike lane in my city, and it's a two-way lane. I confirmed this with the city. It's intended to move traffic, bike traffic in both directions. And going the other way, it's fine. It connects to the river pathway, which is great. But on this end, it's fine until we get to this spot. And let me show you. It's at a bus stop, but the lane just stops. If I want to keep going, I need to do this weird cross the street and I hold up car traffic. It's, I'm on the wrong side of the road. It's confusing for me. It's confusing for motorists. It's weird and it's all because of this bike lane is incomplete. It feels like it just, it feels like the bike lane just gave up on me. It's what you could say is a half-hearted bike lane. Hey everyone, I'm Tom and this is Shifter, a channel about urban cycling, bike commuting, and the ways we get around our cities. If you like this video, please consider subscribing and a big thanks to all those people who have supported this channel with super thanks over the last several weeks. And if you like it, maybe consider hit, hitting that super thanks button yourself. Do you ever get the feeling that cities are only reluctantly building bike infrastructure? That was an example of what I might call half-hearted bike lanes. And these kinds of things are everywhere. Half-hearted infrastructure can be paint instead of actually building a proper bike lane or disconnected routes or routes that just disappear on you. And in some cities, half-hearted infrastructure is everywhere. And I don't think it's appreciated just how discouraging this can be for people who want to ride bikes but are a bit more timid. And I was reminded recently about the risks of half-hearted infrastructure and the benefits of full-hearted wholehearted infrastructure, complete infrastructure on a trip into New York City. And so I was in New York for just a couple of hours one morning recently, and I managed to convince John Orcutt to get out of bed early and take me for a ride. This is John Orcutt. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, great to be here. Now, John has a ton of experience in this area. For decades, he's advocated for a better pedestrian city, for better mass transit. Uh, he currently works for Bike NYC, advocating for better bike infrastructure. And crucially, he was in the Bloomberg administration under Jeanette Sadek Khan when the city built so many bike lanes that it really transformed the image of New York City. And because it's New York, influenced so many other cities uh, elsewhere to become more bike friendly. And in these short couple of hours, John took me on a quick trip through Brooklyn where we took a look at some of the good and the bad. And we didn't have time to uh, assess the whole city. But what I did pick up on this trip was the importance of complete, well-built infrastructure and the risks of half-assing it. Let's go take a look back in New York. Let's get started on a project that was important in the development of a more bike-friendly New York nearly a decade ago, here on the Pulaski Bridge that links Brooklyn with Queens. What's cool about this bridge is that it was rebuilt in the, say, around 1990. Six lanes for cars and buses and trucks. Uh, around 2015, one of those cars was repurposed and made for bikes only. Before that, bikes were kept in this narrow side path with pedestrians. It was bad for everybody. Uh, it was crowded. Um, these neighborhoods are developing very fast, so it was becoming increasingly crowded. The city finally admitted that this bridge is overbuilt and said, we can take one of these lanes and make a bike lane. What's been the consequence uh, of that? What's the change? Well, before the Brooklyn Bridge got the same treatment, this bridge was moving more bikes per month, per year than the Brooklyn Bridge was because nobody wanted to ride on the Brooklyn net anymore because the pedestrian path was so crowded. And the subway um, is here, but it's not direct to Manhattan. So it's actually um, often faster to use a city bike to get to the Manhattan subway than to mess around with the Crosstown subway. So it's, you know, it just works. And, you know, with more and more people working from home or flex time, whatever, there's just a lot more bike traffic around yeah, here. It just makes life a little bit easier to get around on your bike. Yeah, fantastic. We carried on through Brooklyn and came upon a bike lane project that you might call a little half-hearted. It shows some of the challenges when a city isn't prepared to fully commit to proper bike infrastructure. Yeah, we're on West Street in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and it's part of uh, an emerging waterfront greenway. Right. And this, this street was actually rebuilt. One of the biggest problems with Bike Friendly New York, or the idea of it, is that we were mostly trying to paint our way to it. And without traffic law enforcement, it doesn't work that well. And Without good execution, it also doesn't work well. This is supposed to be a curb-separated lane. The curb was designed to be mountable, which is a bad idea in New York. And the curb is very low in terms of the reveal versus the crown of the road here. Um, and with an emerging retail sort of sector here, this is often parked up with delivery trucks, Ubers, owners of these retail establishments. And you can see people driving and parking in it right down there. And 
we passed an Amazon truck, which is still up there um, in the lane. Yeah. Um, even though there's parents and kids, you know, trying to use this bike lane in the mornings. So it's okay. It's not great. The city puts these plastic things in, which is completely futile. They get run over and destroyed routinely. And so we call these vertical paint because drivers just drive on them. Um, you know, and you know, you look around really bike friendly places, they do these in steel because it's not like Dutch drivers are virtuous people. They just can't drive here because they would have to run over steel. We kept going and came upon a connected route that just felt much more committed. Check out this bike lane compared to the one that we were just on. Okay, so where are we now? Now we're on uh, the like lower part of Kent Avenue along the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Yeah. And this is an example, still kind of an example, an exception that proves the rule. Um, where we have a well-executed, constructed bike path. Uh, you can see the difference just by looking at it. There's separation from the road. There's a barrier between, or a gap between pedestrians and cyclists. The city did this just a few years ago. They did it well, and they did it pretty fast, unlike its counterpart on the other side of the Navy Yard that took about 10 years to do. We're starting to see more of this in the city. We need to see much, much more of it. You know, if we want to come up to like a London standard of bikeability, we're going to have to reform how we do construction, public construction in the city, how we manage contractors on public jobs, um, and really whether we're gonna have to rebuild the whole street before we change this side of the street. So there's, there's a bunch of issues with it. The good news is it's here, it's a good example. We need to replicate it. There are other ways that cities can half-heartedly pretend to build more bike friendliness, and that was laid bare to me in many places in New York. And this is where I saw people parking their cars in the bike lanes. Now, I often hear New Yorkers complaining about this on the internet, but to be honest, I was still appalled at the prevalence of this in the city. Maybe some of this was my slightly naive Canadian tendency towards rule following, but it felt like parking scofflaws were everywhere in New York, and it felt like those who were doing the parking had like no concern whatsoever about being punished for breaking the law. So this, I think, is another example of half-hearted bike friendliness, a lack of enforcement. So here we are on a kind of median placed bikeway. Um, this basically is here because there's a huge amount of demand to get to the bridges up here, but we're also going into more interaction with the highways network and highway ramps. Um, so it actually made sense to route the bikes up the center of the street. Again, it had to be a construction project. You can't just do this with paint. And this section here with the mountable curbs, still often blocked by trucks, cops, fire trucks, whatever. A um, little better on the next block where it's actually fenced off. We're here near the, the Manhattan court system where this is supposed to be a bike lane right along the curb and the court officers feel like it's their you know, given right to park wherever they want and set policy for the city for whatever reason. And the mayors, the last two mayors have let them get away with that. And so that's not gonna change till we get a mayor who's gonna make city government all pull in one direction, which is no easy task given the size of New York and New York city government, which is a really big set of institutions. So, you know, we still have a long way to go, but I think, you know, you need that leadership, which we're seeing in places like London and Paris, uh, Montreal. We're not seeing it now in, uh, in New York. Now on to our last example, and this is definitely the most high profile because this is the famous Brooklyn Bridge, which is not only a tourist draw in itself because it's gorgeous and iconic, but it's a key transportation route between Brooklyn and Manhattan. So for decades, anybody on foot or a bike were forced to share the same narrow pathway while car drivers enjoyed multiple lanes in each direction. Pedestrians complained about cyclists, cyclists complained about pedestrians. The result was that many people simply avoided this route or chose other transportation modes to get across the river, which often meant more congestion on the car lanes because more people were driving. But a couple of years ago, that finally changed and the space was reallocated more equitably. Okay, so this is the approach to the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, we're in downtown Brooklyn. This is the Brooklyn Bridge heading into Manhattan. And where we're standing, what, three years ago was a car lane? Yeah, during much of 2021, there was a construction project here really to push the bikeway off of the pedestrian space and into what had been the car space. So the Brooklyn Bridge has six travel lanes. Now it's five for cars, one for bikes. And the pedestrian promenade has been freed of the mixed bike ped chaos. And it was pretty chaotic before. Really chaotic. And so chaotic that actually bike volume had been dropping for quite a few years up here. You could take the Manhattan Bridge, which wasn't too far over, 
But Br Brooklyn Bridge bike volumes have doubled since this opened, and the Manhattan Bridge volumes haven't fallen off. So we seem to be generating new bike trips with good infrastructure. But it must be chaos for car drivers now, right? Losing a lane? Didn't that back everything up? Well, it's pretty backed up anyway. And, you know, if things go well, we'll have a pretty heavy toll on this bridge in a, in a couple of years. So I'd say, you know, and some of these people are toll shopping. There's an expensive toll tunnel just over here. Oh. They might as well go through that tunnel once the once congestion prices. So they have options. They will have options. They do have options today. And, you know, frankly, these guys could all take the subway if they want to. Right, yeah. Okay, we're gonna or cross the Or bike on this excellent. Or take a bike, yeah, yeah. why not? <laughs> Thank you, that was great. Uh, gave me a good insight into what's going on in New York. If you had to sum things up, what's uh, one takeaway that other cities can learn from what New York has experienced? Well, I mean, I, I, I think what a lot of places can learn and what a lot of places have learned since we started changing streets up in New York and you know, back in the Bloomberg years was city streets are not like geologic formations. You can change them, you can manage them. You can do whatever you want with them. You just have to design them for the things you want. So if you design for cars and traffic, you're gonna get cars and traffic. If you design for people and bikes, you'll get people and bikes. You hopeful? Yeah, I am, I am hopeful. I mean, just, just riding around on a cold winter morning, seeing all the people on bikes, seeing the different types of vehicles, seeing the parents with cargo bikes full of kids. Um, those things, you know, the infrastructure tells you what to do and our infrastructure is, is getting there. We just, we need to free it up from, from these guys. Great. Well, thank you, John, for all your work in the city over the years and thanks for showing me around today. Oh yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, okay. Great to do it. So that was a super quick rip through one smidgen of New York City. So, uh, but I actually learned a lot. We just went to a few places, but John's insight really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, a couple of points. One was I totally agree with his idea that there's this impression that cities were just like dropped from the sky and they can't be changed, but he's totally right. If a city as congested and busy and uh, crowded as New York City can find space, both on the streets and in its political discourse for better bike infrastructure, then it seems ridiculous to me that so many other cities can't. This experience also got me thinking that maybe we ought to pay more attention to the risks of half-assed bike infrastructure. Sadly, in most cities these days, it still takes a bit of political capital to get a bike lane built. And if that po political capital is spent on a project that is half-assed and it doesn't work and it's not connected and people drive all over it, it's gonna fail. And then that political capital is gone forever. And so if we're going to invest in a bike lane, if we're going to build a bike-friendly piece of infrastructure, do it right, make sure it works. Make a connected, complete, safe network. Otherwise, they're doomed to fail and you who knows when that political capital will come back to be spent again on a project like that. Well, that's it. Thanks to John for sharing his wisdom on that cold winter morning in New York City. I can't wait to get back to that city and really explore it a bit more. And I hope you learned something from this video because I know I sure did. Thanks for watching, see you next time.